Sunlight Beach has been on the forefront addressing environmental issues such as sea level rise. The city now has to contend with cancer-causing chemicals that were once used in firefighting foam at Patrick Air Force Base and now have been found in its groundwater. Welcome to I Am Brevard, I'm Isadora Rangel. This week I'm talking to Satellite Beach City Manager Courtney Barker about what the city is doing to address a suspected cancer cluster caused by those chemicals and why the city has decided to deal with sea level rise before it gets worse. Here it is. Courtney, thank you for being on the show. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. So let's begin with um, these uh, cancer-causing chemicals that have been found in water mm -hmm. um, around Satellite Beach. Um, so far, it's only been found in groundwater, right? Mm -hmm. But explain a little bit just how you came aware of the issue and what has the city done so far to, to address it, given that there's uh, no concern about uh, possibly a cancer cluster in Satellite. So mm -hmm. what has the city done so far regarding this issue? Um, so far, let's see, back... I think it was in uh, early June, maybe late May, I, I received, a, a, actually a resident tagged me in a Facebook post about the March 2018 Department of Defense report that came out that was talking about uh, perfluorinated chemicals or compounds that were um, a, a cr on bases across the nation and particularly on Patrick Air Force Base and she asked, have you tested the city's groundwater? And I read the report and we became pretty concerned. So we um, started calling labs to do some testing of the groundwater. And it took us probably about two or three weeks to figure out how to do that. And we decided to drill new uh, wells. And um, the reason why was because that chemical is in a lot of the um, things we construct the wells with. So we wanted to make sure that that type of contamination wasn't um, present. So we drilled our own wells, we tested the, the for the compounds. At that point, we knew that we were going to find them, um, and we did. Uh, luckily, that you know, it's very unfortunate that they're under there, and we're, we're still pretty upset about it. But um, it is under the ground or the um, drinking water standard of, of EPA's health advisory, which is 70 parts per trillion, and the highest that we found was 45 parts per trillion in the groundwater. Um, our residents don't drink our groundwater in Satellite Beach. We drink City of Melbourne's water. Um, which so is sourced in um, wells across the bridge as well as Lake Washington. And do we know exactly how those chemicals got in the water? Like you mentioned, uh, they're found in several products mm -hmm. and also in the firefighting foam mm -hmm. that was used at Patrick. Any idea of the link between how, the, how those chemicals actually got in the water? Well, obviously there's a lot of um, areas on Patrick Air Force Base that has um, those chemicals and, and that tested quite high for those chemicals. So. Clearly, Patrick Air Force Base is a source for that. But also, you know, I think it's important for um, residents and citizens across Brevard County to know that those chemicals are in a lot of household products. And even though they've been phased out over time in the United States in terms of manufacturing, they're still manufactured across, um, you know, in other areas overseas, and they're brought in um, in, in, chem in household goods today. So you can still wear clothing that's waterproof clothing that still has it. You could put sunscreen on your skin that still has that in it. Um, you can still use Teflon pans that still have that those chemicals in it. So it's important to know that. And, that, and because of that, um, it's in the groundwater probably everywhere. Um, so we're doing another pretty big comprehensive testing um, round with the county to determine exactly what that extent is. And uh, I believe the state ha is also getting involved in terms of trying to identify identify these possible clusters. Do you see us ever figuring out whether people who have cancer or had early onset cancer, different types of cancer, are we going to be able to figure out whether it was caused by these chemicals? I mean, where does that stand today? Do you have any idea? We really don't. The, the These compounds, the per perfluorinated compounds, are still... Um, newly studied, if I guess you could call that. Um, so on the state and national level, there's not a lot of information yet about them. And, and honestly, the standards for the drinking water and groundwater standards across the nation that are being developed change quite a bit over time. Um, and they, they seem to be getting uh, more stringent over time. So it's, as we know more about them, um, we'll, we'll, we'll be able to, to guide people better, but right now we just don't know. Um, and so it's, it's really difficult to, to determine a cancer cluster in the first place, 
it's even harder to figure out how you know those residents and pinpoint one particular thing um, that that are getting the cancer so I don't know if we'll ever be able to answer that question and, uh, and the city has passed, um, has asked the state to set standards, right? And also the federal government for funding mm -hmm. um, to clean up those chemicals, I believe. Mm -hmm. Can you explain where, in, where are you in the process of possibly getting help from the state and the federal government? Well, we've gotten a lot of support from our local delegation. Um, and, you know, we've created a resolution requesting state the state to set standards for groundwater and drinking water. Um, standards for those compounds. A lot of states have their own standards. Um, our state does not. So I think the fallback right now has been the EPA health advisory. But a health advisory is not a regulatory standard. So that's what we're requesting the state to create. Um, and I don't know where the state is on that. We have a meeting with them in a couple of weeks and we'll, we'll see then. And uh, in the meantime, we have all these people who want answers, right? I mean, and understandably so, they've had cancer. Um, for you dealing with this side of this human side of the issue, how has it been for you? And you know, what is the city tr trying to do to manage you know all these requests and complaints and you know people getting very passionate and emotional, emotional about this issue? Well, we've got we've got a lot of um, people on both sides of the issue. So, on the we have a lot of residents who are obviously very fearful. They want to make sure that their children are safe, that they're safe, and um, they're working with us to make sure that happens. So they're they're bringing in their request of what they want us to test. So we're um, trying to satisfy those requests, and we have written those into our scoping plan for um, groundwater testing. And um, and we have some residents that are concerned about. Um, you know, is our chlorates and our drinking water okay? Things like that. So we've set up meetings with the water utility so they could talk through that water through those issues with the water utility. Um, but what we probably the biggest hurdle right now is the misinformation that's on social media that's constantly taking our time. And so we're we're trying to address that as well, which has been hard for us. So you spend a lot of time on Facebook just answering questions and trying to clarify things. Well, we were. Um, there's been a Facebook page that was set up for um, residents by um, a non-resident and that uh, we've been locked out of that Facebook page so we've had to uh, we're getting ready to write a beach caster um, to inform our community about what we've been doing and make sure that we get the information that way and uh, you mentioned that you have, have received several requests for testing how many of those requests and are you going to be able to fulfill all of, all of those yeah um, once you get it's really the sampling that's you know the cost and once you get um, you know the, the sample done getting it tested for more than one thing is not it's not that big of a cost difference so we're trying to make sure we get all of what they want in there um, and we had we've gotten some good feedback from some community residents about you know what could have been a former military um, dumping site back in the 50s and 60s so we are following through with those investigations so with the county um, so all of that is it's not that hard to to extend those design you know the testing to to satisfy the con those concerns but um, we've had probably maybe six residents who've asked us to do test for certain compounds and certain chemicals Wow that's very interesting mm -hmm. we have very informed residents. Mm -hmm. um, and now Erin um, Brockovich has a scheduled visit here mm -hmm. um, and she she already sent one of her associates and some residents were complaining that the city had a closed door meeting with that associate. Mm -hmm. Can you address that concern that they believe that the city might have violated open meeting laws? Uh, can you address that and explain the reason for that meeting? Yeah. So um, the associate was Mr. Bob Bocock, he's uh, apparently, uh, he donates his time as a consultant to address some of the concerns that are sent in to Ms. Brockovich and um, he requested a meeting with uh, the city and whoever we thought would be appropriate so we invited um, representatives from Patrick Air Force Base, state representatives and then we invited the press as well, um, particularly Florida Today and um, the Melbourne Beach Cider just to make sure that, that the transparency was there. Um, what we did not want was this certain group that has been um, very vocal on social media and taking videos of staff members and things like that and 
taking, editing them to the point of changing the context. And we did not want that to happen at this meeting. So um, we wanted the meeting to be productive and professional. So what we did was um, we closed the meeting to the public, allowed the press in, um, had a professional meeting, and um, we had one council member in there at a time, and the council members just didn't really participate um, to make sure that we complied with Sunshine Law. And uh, Ms. Brockovich, is, she's scheduled to be here on Saturday, I believe. Obviously, this is a case that's uh, getting national attention. Mm -hmm. um, does it help to have someone with, you know, someone like Erin Brockovich visit the area? And what are you trying to get out of her visit? What it, mm -hmm. And is there anything that she can do to, to help us? Well, we were trying to highlight um, it would be great if the Department of Defense had the adequate funding to clean up their sites. Um, they do a great job at Patrick Air Force Base, I think, um, in meeting with them on, on the money, with the money that they get. Um, but it, you know, obviously, we all need more. And um, we also think there needs to be more um, funding into researching these compounds and how they impact our, our water bodies, our adjacent water bodies. We're very concerned with how they're affecting the lagoon and the wildlife. Um, so that's another issue that we're requesting assistance with. And we are hoping that um, we have a resident who's very concerned with um, certain aspects of um, the disinfectants we use in our drinking water. And so we had her there to, to talk about that with Mr. Bocock and, um, and he had some ideas on how to fix that. So we're hoping that maybe he could, he could do that. Um, we haven't heard anything back though. And so it seems obviously we, we don't know the exact source of these chemicals, but there's a, a strong possibility that they came from, from Patrick Air Force Base. Mm -hmm. uh, do you get a sense that as a city you're kind of stuck holding a bucket when obviously this wasn't caused by the city, it was caused by the federal government, and now you're basically being left to deal with the issue? Uh, yes and no. I mean, I think most of our residents know that there's not a lot we can do about it. Um, I think there's sometimes there's people who take an issue and and make it more than it is to for political purposes and and that sometimes happens um, but I think most of our residents understand that we um, can't do much about it we had we do are we are looking into one site that tested higher to see if it had to do with an old dry cleaner and and it was funny because I was actually hoping it did because that is something that we can, yeah, <laughs> you can we, go could, we could address right. ourselves because um, that is something that we could we could designate a brownfield and, and clean it up, but um, you know, unless we find proof of that, we, we can't. So. And what have have you figured out whether it was a dry cleaner or not? It was, but we we so we test we're testing around that specific property in this next round of testing to see if we can make that determination. So it seems like this chemical these chemicals can be found in pretty much everything. Mm -hmm. And then how do you identify the culprit? It seems like this might be an issue where you don't really have someone to blame, which makes it a lot harder to solve mm -hmm. it, right? It is, and that's a that's a big issue with large scale, especially groundwater contamination, because you really, particularly with a compound like this, to pinpoint blame is hard. Um, you know, and it's easy it's easier when you have a gas tank leak or something yeah. like that. You know, but this is different, and that that's you know that's where unfortunately um, the taxpayers get to foot that bill. And so, speaking, still speaking about water, but moving on, uh, moving on a little bit. Satellite Beach is obviously known for being very forward with environmental issues, and one of the things the city has done is address uh, sea level rise. Mm -hmm. um, can you explain why the city has been so proactive? I mean, we're not the only city on the coast, but Satellite Beach is definitely one of the cities, along with Miami Beach and others, mm -hmm. who are taking um, a proactive step in addressing it. How did that start for the city? Like okay, we need to pay attention to this issue. We are just very lucky in the community of Satellite Beach to have incredibly smart, talented residents because we have, we had two residents, Dr. Ken Lindemann and Dr. John Fergus, who served on our planning advisory, um, comprehensive planning advisory board in 2009, and they started that, the first study that we did. Um, so if it wasn't for them, we probably wouldn't be as far along as we are now. And it's a good thing too, because we have now found um, through GIS mapping with um, Stetson University and a Florida Sea Grant that we have utilities that are sitting in water. Um, I mean, they're just sitting, the, the water table's yeah. so high, um, especially the, in the um, high tide that it's, they're, they're being infiltrated constantly by water. So um, it's stuff like that, that, you know, we've, we've taken a lot of um, 
forward thinking steps, particularly in coastal erosion and, and flooding. And what were some of the key findings of that study? We, the key findings have been that we need to look at, um, well, we have, we're gonna have new flood zones. We already have new flood zones. Um, it'll change pretty rapidly over time. And um, we need to, to start looking at better building patterns, um, possibly, you know, stilting buildings in certain locations. Um, looking at trying to discourage development in the flood zones and encourage the redevelopment in the areas that are a little higher and drier, stuff like that. So I imagine you had to make changes to your comprehensive plan to mm -hmm. address that. Yep, we have already have. So we've done a lot of changes to our comprehensive plan. We started with coastal erosion. We've, um, we're in the process of increasing the construction setback from the ocean, um, which is garnered some attention. <laughs> yeah. Um, so whenever you do code changes like that, it, it affects people personally. So that, that's a hard thing to do. And uh, you mentioned that, what is the time frame? You mentioned that we're gonna have more flood zones in the future. Mm -hmm. How many years from now are we talking about? We are looking at, we have planning horizons of um, 20, 40, and so on, uh, years from now. And um, right now, to give you an example, we have a fire station that's on South Patrick Drive. During the hurricanes, it was the roads were flooded in front of the, the station, and we have a public works department that's kind of right across the street, and the public works department was flooded. And we started looking at the future flood zones of that area and realized that we don't want to reconstruct buildings there. We're getting ready to do a lot of improvements yeah. um, and spend money that we want to last for 100 years in an area that we may have to move in 20. So we actually purchased property in another area and we're gonna be building new buildings in that area. Wow, that, that's alarming to mm -hmm. hear that, that you're actually changing how you, how do you construct your buildings yeah. because of this issue. Um, is Satellite Beach more vulnerable than other communities or is just that Satellite Beach is just really paying attention to the issue when other communities might not be is that what you think it is or? Well, we have, we all have different issues. So you may have um, a satellite beach, I would say from Patrick Air Force Base to Melbourne Beach, we have a very highly eroded area. So um, it's designated by DEP, so coastal erosion's a big deal for this area. You may not have that issue over on the West Coast, um, but every coastal community, is. this is a big issue for Florida every coastal community. I think in that case, if people, if you see communities not looking at it, it's just that they're not, um, they're not, it's hard because they're not concerned about it because it's not right in their face, yeah. um, or that they're just afraid of the answer. And, and, and obviously we still have a lot of lawmakers who don't believe climate change is caused by human activity. And how do you approach this topic? Because obviously sea level rise and climate change, they, they go mm -hmm. hand in hand, but how do you approach this topic with lawmakers and because obviously you want them on your team but mm -hmm. how do you approach that with them when they might not even believe that climate change is even happening or that it might be caused mm -hmm. by by human activity so i think you know it's hard for us as a as the city of satellite beach because we we have been very vocal in that arena so i when we had our public meetings a lot of people cautioned us not to use the words climate change and stuff like that and we refused to do that um, it is climate change it's happening um, but we do we do understand that people are fearful of of looking at it and that they i think that and i think that comes out of fear is you know not wanting to face that it's a huge issue it affects so many things and so for people to to be fearful of looking into that it's totally understandable so we try to temper our you know comments a little bit but I, I have to say that we're pretty truthful in saying look it is it is climate change and yeah unless we change something like um, you know changing our energy use stuff like that we're gonna be dealing with a lot bigger issues and what's the response you usually get to that I think most people I think the tide is changing I have to say uh, re, um, People that, especially elected officials that used to look at me like I was crazy five years ago, are now starting to pay attention. Oh, really? So, that's yeah. that's good news, especially mm -hmm. now with hurricanes. I mean, you have information even coming from the federal government yeah. that hurricanes, um, you know, potentially can become worse yes. because of climate change, and it's just, you know, it's. I'm glad to hear that mm -hmm. people are paying attention to climate change potentially being a cause for that, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And especially for Satellite Beach, that's a big issue. Um, 
So why is that a, like you, you mentioned you have very small, very smart residents, mm -hmm. but why is Satellite Beach so, you know, always on the forefront of, of these environmental issues? I mean, what makes it so special? I don't, I, you know, I don't know. It's always been that way. It, it, was there, it was like that well before I got there. They have always looked at acquiring beachfront property. I mean, the city owns 40% of our beachfront. Um, we have 16 beach accesses where you see other cities. Um, near us have maybe three or four so they've always been that way and you know we have Samson's Island you know some communities chose to build on islands like that we chose to preserve it so it's just it's just a culture I think that it's always been there and uh, one of the latest things you've done is the City Council passed a resolution mm -hmm. encouraging businesses mm -hmm. to stop using plastic straws again it's not a ban and right. businesses can opt in and out and you mentioned Indie Atlantic did it before, mm -hmm. but yes. you guys ended up getting the credit because you have this reputation. Yeah. But um, explain the issue with plastic straws. And in the last few months, we've heard so much more about it than mm -hmm. ever before. But why why are plastic straws such a big issue? Well, I think you know plastic straws in themselves are there. It's almost like a sim, a, sim, a symbol of what we use that never goes away. I mean, every every piece of plastic that's ever been made is still to, is still here today, and yeah. and it's completely unnecessary. We do not need them, and I think that we pick on them because of that reason. Is it's a good symbol, um, and and if you look at the trash on the beaches, and you're part of the community that picks it up, you'll you'll hear from them that the the cups, the lids, and the straws, and you know, along with the cigarettes, the cigarette butts, and stuff like that. Are one of the most popular things they pick up, so I think it just it's a it's a way for us to call attention to the the disposable things we use all the time that we don't really need, and it's you know where we're focusing. And what has been the response from businesses? Are they gonna are they on board mm -hmm. with the city? Every uh, almost every restaurant. I, in fact, I have yet to find one that has not got on board with that in the city of Satellite Beach. Um, we had some ones that right off the bat came on board, Papagallos, you know, um, Sun on the Beach, um, Long Doggers, some of the, the ones that we all, you know, know and love. And then, and then I went through Taco Bell and went through the drive through and she asked me if I wanted a straw. So I think that's a good indication that people are catching on. And could the city in, in the near future, let's say, completely ban plastic straws? Is that something that the city is considering? Um, the city's not considering that right now. Um, it, I mean, a city could do that, um, but it looks like the community and the culture is starting to change, and I'm hoping that we don't have to do that because, you know, we don't like to tell people what to do. We just want to encourage them. So, you know. And any, could, you, could a city take one step forward? For example, we still have plastic bags, and we have those styrofoam boxes that, mm -hmm. like for carryouts, and those are, I know are really bad for mm -hmm. the environment. I mean, could the city maybe expand? Mm -hmm. Like you see other cities outside of even Florida doing that with yep. plastic bags and other types of pools. Well, unfortunately, on the state level, they preempted us yes. from banning plastic bags and styrofoam. Um, so. But we did do, our, our city passed a resolution and an ordinance that um, requires anybody that does business with us. So if we do like an event or anything like that, the business has to, they, they're not allowed to use styrofoam containers. And so that's something that we could do. And we started using that, practicing that amongst ourselves. Um, but until the state changes, you know, they're thinking we, we really can't do much about that. And uh, I actually covered this issue in Tallahassee mm -hmm. with plastic bags, and it's just, I know a lot of cities have signed petitions mm -hmm. asking the state, is, is Satellite Beach involved in trying to mm -hmm. have the legislature change its mind? And it's mind-boggling that they won't, yeah. um, but obviously they're under a lot of pressure from retailers and mm -hmm. all of that, but is, has the city lobbied a lot oh, yeah. in Tallahassee for that? Yeah, we passed a resolution along with Surfrider um, some years ago, and we, we complain about it every time we go to Tallahassee. We don't like being preempted on anything, honestly. Yeah. I mean, the we believe that the government closest to the people works best for the people. Um, so, which basically means that if somebody comes in, it's easier to complain to me than somebody on the state level. Um, but the plastic bag, or the, I guess you would call it the shopping association, um, retailer association, yeah are very dead set against it and they want to have a uniform regulation across the state which makes it easier for them um, but it makes it harder for local governments to do what their residents want 
in, in the coastal communities, we're the ones that see the sea turtles wash up and we're the ones that see the plastic bags in the ocean. Um, so it's, you know, you'll see a bigger interest on the coastal side or among coastal communities to see the plastic bags go away. And, uh, and right before we started shooting, um, we were talking about recycling mm -hmm. and how important it is that we educate people on what they should put in their recyclable bins. But uh, we have roughly um, less than two minutes left. But explain a little bit, what are the lessons that people should learn about recycling? I think it's so important to get that message across. Recycling is a tough business and that's, it's a business. So if they don't have a market for it, it's not gonna get recycled. So that's what one of the things that waste management was trying to get across was, you know, yes, everything is recyclable. I mean, everything is really. It's just whether or not somebody has wants to buy it. And if there's no market for it, it goes in the trash. So right now, if you put a plastic bag in um, your recycle bin, it will mess up the machines at the plant. And when I was there touring, it shut down four times while I was there because of plastic bags. Plast uh, hoses are not recyclable. Things like that, they just don't recycle. What they like is the thick plastics, like a, a two-liter bottle. That there's a big market for that right now. So those types of plastics, um, rinse them out, dry them, put them in your recycle bin. Recycle well, not everything, and try to reduce how much you use. And uh, we have only a few seconds left, but you, you're a lifelong resident of Brevard County. How have we progressed on environmental issues and trying to be more you know, better stewards of the environment. What is your assessment of what has happened in the last few decades here? I think in the, the county itself has been somewhat, you know, a pretty big leader in um, environmental issues and we've had some of the most stringent wetland protection codes and things like that. We've always, always been like that. Um, but recently with the lagoon, we've become a leader and I think the community should be very proud of themselves in passing that lagoon tax. Courtney, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you. That's it for our show today. You can rewatch all I Am Brevard episodes at Florida Today's YouTube channel, and I'll see you again next week.